if I go all the way back to my early experiences of speaking to people in my banking days over the phone around money in their account mm -hmm. versus talking to when I worked in grocery for customers who received bruised bananas, they both were equally as unhappy as each other. Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, bruised bananas are a real issue. Um, they are. They're so. a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so. Absolutely. Hello everybody and welcome to another video episode of CX Insider. This time Adam and I talk to Sham Aziz, head of customer service at Selfridges. We talk about Sham's formula for great customer service, the latest technology trends, most popular service channels and more. Enjoy the episode and don't forget to share your thoughts on our LinkedIn page. By the way, this podcast was brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Hey, Shem. Hey. Thank you very much for coming today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you guys doing? All right? Yeah, I'm yeah. good. Very good, thanks. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um, so we usually start off by doing a little introduction. Uh, so would you like to tell us something about yourself and your career, your background, what you do? Sure. So my name's Sham. I'm head of customer service at Selfridges. Uh, second part of my role this year includes the diversity board, of which I'm deputy chair. And I guess in my main life, I'm practicing to be an adult. And uh, being a parent, that's kind of my main job to a nine year old terror of a son. The most rewarding job, but also the most difficult job I've ever had. <laughs> Couldn't agree more with that, to be honest. <laughs> Could you also tell us a bit more about like what you do on your, you know, as your as part of your career on your day to day basis? Sure. So um, I spent about 20 years in customer service, a little bit over that now. Um, I started way back on the phones, telling people their bank balance. Um, fast forward to today at Selfridges, there's, I guess, three main parts to the role. There's running the day-to-day -day operation, what we're doing over the next 12 months, whether that's projects that we're going to deliver. And then finally, it's what's the strategy over the next three years, five years, where should we go and the roadmap to get there. So all exciting stuff. Mm, absolutely. So, so you, spent, you spent, how long did you say you were working, you were working in answer the telephone and telling people about balances? How long did you do that for? Uh, well, that was some 21, 22 years ago, and I okay. did that for about three years. Okay. Um, I fell into it by accident in terms of customer service. It was yeah. a job to do after college. Um, and, I, and I liked the open plan nature of the contact center. It was a different way of working. It was different to retail, being on the mm. shop floor as an example. Um, and then I started to progress within the contact center. I started having training sessions, okay. developed into a team leader, and then I saw that there was a career for me, and that's... There's a contact centre, this is an interesting idea, but but has the contact centre changed much in 21, 22 years? Yeah, exponentially. Has it? Um, even just from the, the naming convention. So if you go okay. all the way back, they used to be called call centres. Mm -hmm. We used to get faxes, you know, customers sending a fax. Valentina, do you know what a fax is? <laughs> you actually tell you? <laughs> I remember seeing that as an option on the internet whenever I need to send something yeah, or but in, as a kid, museum. but I don't remember how it, okay. or I've never used it. Yeah, I don't sure know how age. it works. But yeah, just a little bit, <laughs> maybe we could cut that part out. Yeah, we will. <laughs> but um, yeah, they used to be called call centers. Okay. Um, and then there was a channel shift where email sort of came in. And so then it was a contact center. Mm. And then there was a sort of like a rebranding exercise that took part and uh, we started calling them customer experience centers. Okay. Um, today, customer experience is more aligned to online and the digital side of things. Um, so now it's kind of gone back to a customer center or a contact center. And some people still say call center. Yeah. So if you hear somebody say call center, then they've got some experience behind them because they've been in the game been for a while. while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Formulas make our lives easier. No matter how much we don't like learning them at school, once we know how to use them, we can apply them to solve difficult tasks. They help us understand how things work. People are coming up with formulas all the time. Only two weeks ago, scientists created formula for the perfect start to your day. There are even claims mathematicians made the formula for love. Similarly, Shem was looking for the formula for the best customer service. Yeah, I, um, I was up very late and I was just pondering this question around customer service. I'm always trying to figure out how to improve it, tinkering with it as part of my day job. But um, I ended up going down this road where I thought we could turn it into a formula. Okay. Um, and so essentially 
it's the idea that if you could resolve something, it could lead to a better reputation, mm -hmm. which could then lead to retention. So the formula would be resolution times reputation okay. times retention equals fire emoji. Okay. And so <laughs> the idea is if you can nail those three points, then there'll be fire emojis. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the goal. That's where anyone and everyone's trying to get to. If we think a little bit to our marketing colleagues, retention is that sort of golden metric that everybody's trying to get to. And I believe you could do that through customer service. Mm -hmm. So like for me, customer service is the glue 100%. that binds products, services, and experiences. Um, and so if we can do a bit of a rebranding exercise in the world of customer service and demonstrate that value back into the business, uh, then we get a seat at the table. Within that then, so you've got, Obviously, one of the things you mentioned was reputation. How how do you affect reputation, um, if that makes sense? You, I understand you can obviously do retention and customer experience, customer service is huge. Mm. But what about reputation or what kind of effect and control do you have on that? Yeah, so it's, uh, stay with me on this one. Okay, no, fine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, customer service is a touch point. Mm. Uh, it's arguably probably one of the, the biggest touch points. It's a two-way touch point. Um, if you look at marketing, you might send out a DM, mm -hmm. a direct message, direct mail, and then you're waiting for a customer to interact with that. But that doesn't happen in a live scenario. Okay. In customer service, if you're in a conversation, it's two-way interaction. So as part of that, you could either improve the customer's perception mm. or make it worse or stay neutral, right? That's, that's sort of the, the three options that yeah. you have. So that customer attends that conversation with you and they'll leave with one of those three. If they leave with a positive view, then you've added to that brand equity, 100%. and that's where the reputation kicks in. So if you go into a store and you have a fantastic experience, when you call, you should also have a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the same reputation, and that's where I think customer service can positively and sadly sometimes negatively mm -hmm. impact it. And in terms of like this digital age that we're in, has the challenges of that changed a lot? I'm sure they have, but you know, how has that changed in terms of dealing with those channels and those touch points? Because there must be more. Yeah, there's, there's so many channels now. Um, and I guess that's one of the challenges of custom service is mm -hmm. the proliferation of channels where you start adding many more ways for people to get in touch. Uh, on our side of the fence, that's quite hard to juggle. We're trying to make sure that we're in all those channels. Mm -hmm. And then what we're trying to do is make sure that we're consistent across those channels. The skills required to have a phone conversation with somebody versus having a chat conversation with somebody, that typing skill, that's different. So you're yeah. trying to recruit for that and you're trying to make sure that you're equally as good across those channels. And if some customers are channel hopping, so they start with a phone call, they tweet you later that day, they send you an email overnight waiting mm. for a response in the morning, that's quite tricky to stay on top of and make sure that you're resolving that for a customer. So I think if... I could give anybody advice it would be to do less better okay um and so pick the sort of the two three top ones that you want to go for and do them really really well most people will come there and respond to you mm. um, different channels are more appropriate for different businesses mm. so some businesses lend themselves beautifully to live chat or to messaging um you know asynchronous which is you send a message and then they'll reply when they reply mm. Um, it depends on your business, what you're trying to do, what service you're offering, what your products. Shava mentioned brand equity, the holy grail of branding, the ultimate objective of marketers. Apart from reputation, how else can customer service impact brand equity? Yeah, absolutely. I guess if you take brand equity and you try and break that down and understand what that means, a lot of it is, are you providing a great product, service or experience? There's sort of like the three things that you're going after as a brand. And the role that customer service can play in that, other than making sure they've had a great experience when they turn up, is taking the information that you've been given within your department and then facing inwards to your business and informing them. So if somebody gives you feedback on a marketing campaign, mm -hmm. feed that back into marketing. Mm -hmm. If somebody has used a feature on your website and it hasn't worked quite well, let your IT department know about that. So take that information and use it to create a better journey going forwards. Um, that's ultimately the goal be behind what most businesses are trying to do. They're incrementally trying to improve the experience. Mm. In customer service, we get that information. Customers give that to us. 
that's one of the hardest things for most businesses to do is to talk to customers the beauty of customer services they come and talk to us yeah good point so let's grab that information let's package that up whether that's in a dashboard whether that's in a customer story that you want to tell mm. whether that's a great tweet where somebody's come through and said oh my god you blew my mind great <laughs> service take that share it internally talk to your exec about it go to your various departments and then hopefully behavior will change and the experience will change and then that will continue to build brand equity customer service is often looked at as a loss in profit and loss statements but could it also be the other way around yeah so that's kind of the thing that most people in my position are trying to do we're trying to rebrand customer service or the contact center within our businesses um so we're trying to demonstrate the value that's available mm-hmm. uh we've all had those difficult conversations within budget meetings where we're trying to do more for less productivity is the thing that everybody's going after mm. um and actually i think it's more important to go after the customer experience and if we can align ourselves with these sexy buzzwords like retention and resolution and these things that uh people associate with customers coming back and spending more um then suddenly customer service isn't an L it's a P yeah. so um i would say my advice would be figure out whether you can impact retention for your customer service team and if you can talk to it report on it and if you're able to uh, close sales through your contact center then report on that as well now the reporting for a sale through a contact center most likely sits on a different P&L to yours mm-hmm. um for example it would be on the e-commerce P&L because they've made a sale through the website however if you facilitate that through the contact center then in your reporting you can say we did this many orders over the phone or we did this many orders over live chat and you're starting to demonstrate that you're more than just a race to the bottom in terms yeah. of productivity Most of the time interactions with customer service are initiated by the customers. But customers appreciate to be informed without having to contact customer service. In other words, customer service has more of a reactive role. How could this be improved? Yeah, this is a great question. There's always this thing about if we can deliver information to a customer first before yeah. they want it or need it, yeah. um then you meet them in a neutral territory. So if we take the example of uh, a delayed order if you could tell somebody before that the yeah. order's delayed there might be some disappointment but the news has been broken in, in the other direction versus waiting for somebody to realize the order's delayed and then they get in touch and say where the hell's my order <laughs> um yeah. so the the way that that message is delivered is interesting It, this does come back to using the information that we have so uh, we live in a world of metrics and so for a contact center all of the contact we get we tag that we get a contact we add a note to it and then that allows us to do reporting so for example where is my order if we tag those contacts at the end of the week i could tell you how many of those happened right what day of the week they were which one of our carrier partners it was around and if you take that information and go back in and say is this normal is there anything we could do to improve this um and then you can go and eliminate the root cause of the problem and so you end up taking away so I think there's a bit around can you eliminate something can you reduce something or can you automate something that's kind of that three step program of making it a frictionless customer experience um and so I'd encourage anybody to look at what their contact is whether it's around delivery returns stock and then figure out using that three step method how do I improve the experience customer service expectations are very high The majority of customers expect on-demand service anytime, anywhere. Yet I do wonder whether people expect more from premium brands than from functional brands. Yeah, I mean in my experience, if I go back right at the beginning, there was always this view depending on where you were, whichever your business you were in and what the value proposition of that business was, um that we would build customer personas and we would uh bucket customers and say right these customers expect this experience these customers want this kind of service uh in the end in my experience if there's an exchange so of time or money in return for a product service or experience the expectation in my experience has always been high okay because people are looking at an exchange and they want to feel like they've come better off in that exchange yeah and so um if i go all the way back to my early experiences of speaking to people 
in my banking days over the phone around money in their account mm -hmm. versus talking to when I worked in grocery for customers who received bruised bananas. They both were equally as unhappy as each other. Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, bruised bananas are a real issue. Um, they are. They're so. a big deal. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but uh, every, every customer, it's, it's their problem. Do you know what I mean? It relates to them. So they may think that bruised bananas is as bad as your mortgage payment not going out. Well, it's the thing that's annoying them that day at that time, isn't it? Exactly. And so I think our role within customer service is not to judge anybody. No. Um, it is to resolve their issue and, and try and meet their expectations. So um, I'm, I'm going to call that one a myth. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I will say an unpopular opinion. Personas are an outdated marketing technique. They have been very helpful for the last several decades, but more and more marketers believe that in today's postmodern society, personal identity is so unique to individual consumers and fluid that generalizing these individuals doesn't add much value. Whether that's true or not depends on many factors, but let's hear different perspectives. It is an interesting question. And look, fair disclaimer, I'm not a marketer, right? <laughs> and so if there's, if there's marketers listening to this and I say the wrong thing, I apologize up front. But um, in my experience, from what I've seen around the persona piece is just trying to better understand customers and figure out what you can tweak within your proposition. Um, what's the value you're trying to provide and what's the view that you're providing to that customer? So in my experience, it's always been there's probably this sort of 80% bucket where the value proposition as it is within your business applies to most customers. Mm -hmm. And then that fringe of 20% is ever so slightly different. And those personas help. Um, drive sales, drive experience, drive reputation, all of the above. Um, so I think uh, you can get lost. You can end up with far too many personas. And then you have to question yourself and say, am I here to run a business or am I yeah. here to categorize personas? Um, but I think there's something in it. I think there is something around being able to test and learn your way through your proposition. And sometimes the personas will help you do that. It will help you understand which experiments to run with which groups of customers in order to drive your business forward. Throughout the pandemic, customers shifted to entirely new channels. Now, when things got back to normal, it's difficult to predict which channels will disappear and which will be the leading means of communication. It could be WhatsApp, email or video. Uh, either I'm going to sound like a genius or Go on. I'm not because in six months or six years time, uh -huh. This will age well or it won't. <laughs> so okay. I think with technology, um, I think the jury's still out on video. Um, right. So experience I had recently of trying to buy a mobile phone uh, via video chat, um, it wasn't great. Um, no, no okay. it, was, it was an interesting one. There was this sort of challenge with every video conversation. Most people know this because over the pandemic, we've been using Teams and oh, Zoom yeah. and everything yeah, else, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's always that bit where you look at the screen and you're not looking at the camera. And so yep. you can't really make good eye contact on it. Mobile phone camera's up in the top left. You're yeah. staring there and he's thinking, why is he not looking at me? So yeah. that's that's kind of a bit unsettling when you're trying to buy or sell something. And mm -hmm. it's like, um, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that. Then there's the bit around their background, your background, um, the noise that comes with that and mm -hmm. the distraction that comes with that. Um, I do quite like streaming though. I like the okay. idea of streaming. So product demos via streaming. Um, you know, think back to the days of QVC tele, tele 100%, yeah, yeah. But you know, take that to the internet and think about how you could run in Asian webcast. markets. It's massive, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, indeed, it's incredible, and, and I love it. It's an experience, and yeah. you can sort of see that product, and it's moved on massively from okay. the days of QVC. And if QVC are watching. I haven't recently watched, so maybe they've moved on to. I don't know. Well, the head office used to so. be in London. It was that really kind of outrageous building with other gold sides. Um, makes sense, though, what you're saying. because So, in, in customer service, mm. you don't, at the moment, you just think it's a bit awkward. Do you think, do you think that's because people, when they're in customer service, they've got their problem, they want to resolve it as quickly and efficiently as possible? They probably don't want to faff around with downloading a video app setting up whether their camera's right. They just want to get it done. Yeah. And, I, and in terms of that then, is the most common channel the telephone? Yeah, so just to, I guess, bookend the video piece in terms of customer service rather mm. than the sales part of it, yeah. is that um, I don't know that we've always been sort of customer facing in that sense, okay. especially in the contact center world where you're dealing with a phone call or you're multitasking because you're adding notes to a system mm. or you're trying to type up an email trying to do that via video chat at the same time, you'll just see somebody that's quite distracted who's clicking Very away and typing point. stuff. So 
I'm not sure that that would give you the best experience from a service angle. But I'm open to hearing about businesses out there that are doing it well, and yeah, you know, I'd love to learn about that. Not from salespeople, by the way. So <laughs> just 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 from that side of it. Um, and then second part of your question was the best channel. Well, yeah, yeah. Most so common most common channel. channel. So yeah. you know, me personally, I'm a really impatient consumer, and I can't imagine my persona is that impatient man. And if I've got a problem, I want it to be done. I'm not as bad as the person you kind of mentioned earlier that will send you a message, send you a tweet. I don't do the tweeting thing. I think that's out of order, complaining on some company's tweet, Twitter page. But my preferred channel is a live chat, mainly because I'm multitasking and I'm doing that while on something else. But are you finding that the most common channel is still telephone? Is it live chat? Is it messaging? Or does it really depend on what the product is? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So um, as well as working in the industry for 20 years, I've built up a network of other people who do the same job that I do. Okay, cool. Um, so it's cross industry. What I've seen mostly is that phone is still king. Um, it? it does drive the most volume, usually somewhere around 40 to 50% of contact volume. Mm. Um, and then email is a close second. Um, in some cases over the pandemic, that flipped around a little bit. More emails were being sent than phone calls. Um, but most contact centers are subtly trying to nudge customers into channels that have a better contact resolution. Okay. So rather than have multiple emails going backwards and forwards, if you have one phone call, you might be able to resolve that query. But if you have a live chat session, then you can solve that quickly whilst you're multitasking elsewhere. Mm. So let's say you're working, you could start a live chat session with customer service. They can respond to you, you can deal with that. You could also do other things. Mm -hmm. That's easier in terms of multitasking than say trying to balance a phone on your ear while you're trying to sort of yeah. multitask there. So live chat has quite a great contact resolution. Social has a great contact resolution attached to it. Um, so as well as taking the effort out for ourselves as a department, it can be better experience for the customer as well. Mm. Um, so most people are trying to move away from email within the industry because at least one email has to be sent and one has to come back yeah, in the absolutely. other direction to get anywhere. And so usually email is the, the thing we're trying to eliminate. Bye. <laughs> there are a lot of claims about how artificial intelligence can help businesses be more efficient. Sometimes they are a bit out of touch with reality, but the future sounds promising. Speaking of AI, have you talked to Blenderbot, Meta's latest chatbot? You should try it. It's fun. I think some of the outrageous claims on LinkedIn uh, you know, will reduce 30%, 40%. Yeah. I saw something the other day where they reduced like 80% of contact. And I think we're days away from somebody saying they'll reduce 120% of contact, which I don't even think is possible. <laughs> but at yeah, some boy. point, somebody's going to put that up on yeah. marketing just to like grab the attention. Um, I think you can automate to an extent. If we go back to what I was saying earlier, can you eliminate something? Can you reduce something? Mm. Or then can you automate it? And I'd go that way around. I wouldn't necessarily start with automation up front because you might be hiding the root cause of something. Okay. Just because you've automated it, it might be out of, sign or out of sight and out of mind for you. But if there's a root cause problem there and that you need to go and solve it within your business, then, then you should do that. So mm. I think automation works. Some of the pitfalls of automation would be that you can automate things that are repetitive and yeah. easy. And so what you're doing then for your team, you're giving them the hardest stuff to deal with because you've picked off all the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. So now you've changed the nature of their role. So you need to make sure that what they're dealing with, they're equipped to deal with it. Um, and imagine if you get, I don't know, two, three contacts and uh, you get an easy one and you get a slightly medium one mm -hmm. and a slightly harder one to deal with. If going forwards, everything's just really hard to deal with. It's a tough role. It changes the You're job. You're almost cherry picking the easy ones and giving that to the AI, aren't you? Indeed. Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, that's the glass half empty view. Okay. The glass half full is that if, depending on the type of your contact center and what services you're providing, if you're giving people advice on products and you talk to them about an event that they're going to and style advice, well, that's a great mm. kind of call to have. And it's not one that AI can deal with at least today to my knowledge. <laughs> um, so you, you, you get to have like those kinds of conversations. Yeah. So I think it depends on what your contact center is trying to do or what types of contact you're dealing with. But there's always a role for technology. Okay. Once AI starts solving customer tickets, it will, of course, solve the easiest issues, which will ultimately leave the most difficult tasks to the employees. Everyone who worked in hospitality or customer service knows how exhausting it can be at times. So if AI makes customer service more efficient, it can also put extra pressure on the employees. 
the rise of well-being it's now labeled really well but if we go back many many years people are thinking about how to give staff um, a great place to work mm. whether you know in the olden days that was like a foosball table table yeah. tennis bean bags you know i remember buying an xbox in one of the contact centers that i worked in and we played the olympic games on it and so there's you know it's moved on a bit it's different okay. as it, you know going forwards into like 2022 um well-being just makes sense it's the right thing to do it does pay you back from a business yeah. perspective um but not just from a well-being but actually investing in upskilling of your teams and staff so continuous training continuous learning uh, will lead to improvement for everybody both for staff members but then also for customers so as long as we're happy to keep upskilling as an organization as a culture uh, then i think it will pay back and hopefully you'll get away from difficult conversations because they'll be easier to have i hope you enjoyed listening to the podcast if you did don't forget to like share comment or subscribe to the podcast on your preferred channel most importantly don't forget to join our community on our linkedin page enjoy rapid fire questions and i will see you next time also this podcast is sponsored by acf technologies what's your favorite brand and why what's my favorite brand um so i quite like wearing watches uh, but i certainly don't have the funding that's required to wear the kind of watch that i'd like to wear um, so i recently discovered a brand called seconda which most people will be familiar with yeah. they do fantastic watches um, wrist check um, Checked it out. and um, they, they basically meet my needs it looks the way i want it to look it feels good it does the job that it needs to do and it fits the price point that i'm after um, and it's easy, it's easy to get. Um, and so I'm going to call out Seconda as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite TV show? My God, I was trying to think how much that will reveal about my watching habits. Um, what is my favorite TV show? That's probably rapid fire. I'm not rapid. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that's favorite time, yeah. TV show. Um, doesn't have to be a current show. Yeah, that's what I'm just trying to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what do I normally watch or what did I watch that just like blew my mind and just um, still resonates. Um, my favorite TV show or program that I like to watch, not necessarily on TV anymore, uh, would be the UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship. Um, so it's a little bit different, um, but I just, I just find it interesting how much the fight game has moved on. Mm. Um, and the different aspects of what takes place. So um, I do like to consume a lot of UFC. Mm -hmm. um, what's on your travel list? Um, so from a travel perspective, my wife and I traveled many, many different parts of the world. Um, and then now with a nine-year-old son, we're re-traveling lots of different parts of the world. And so for me, it's trying to explore different places, different cultures, um, and try and be a little bit off the beaten path. Okay. Um, I do look for sun, uh, but I'm not necessarily out there sunbathing. Um, so I guess good climate, good food, but also a little bit of good culture while yeah. we're there. So I don't have one specific destination, but the next one that I'm heading to is Istanbul. Um, and that seems to tick all of those boxes. Great place. Nice. <laughs> Went there last week. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll love it. It's amazing. Massive. It's, it's huge. It's like four times the size of London. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It so doesn't I'm, seem it when you like look at like guides and reviews. But, but, yeah. but you said about heat. Yeah. 47 degrees one day last week. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that wasn't enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best age? Oh, wow. I don't answer that question. I'm just trying to think that one through a little bit. The best age. I think the best age for me is fond memories of growing up and spending time with my dad. So I think any one of those ages, whether it was when I was 10, when I got my first bicycle and learned to ride it with my dad, or um, age 15 when I played cricket with my dad and I wasn't very good and he was trying to teach me and I was frustrating him, but he was trying to improve my form. Just those sort of moments and memories, there's loads of them. And I'm getting to now sort of create those with my son. So. I guess there'll just always be lots of best ages, but built around moments. Mm -hmm. And Adam, do you want to ask your question? You you had the most difficult one. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> I did. I did. So 
if you could have dinner, okay, with three people, two hours, you sit down and have dinner. They can be al alive or dead. It doesn't matter which three people and why. Oh, how's this? That's a, a it almost sounds question. like an interview question. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the job afterwards? Um, <laughs> three people, dead or alive. Um, this will show his real personality now. <laughs> <laughs> he says Hugh Hefner. <laughs> Uh, so, well, let, let's start with Dana White then from okay. the UFC. So he runs the organization, the UFC, that I was talking about earlier. I think that would just be interesting from yeah. beginning to end. Um, second person I'd want to have dinner with is my dad. Um, he's passed away, so that would be wonderful to just get that moment back and have one more dinner. Um, and then third person that I guess I'd like to have dinner with. Um, See, I'm being really picky with my options, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, here's another way of looking at it. You've obviously been in customer service for 20 plus years. Um, if you could go back and speak to any of your managers in the past, is there a specific manager or something you work with that you'd want to go back to and go, thanks, you really show with the ropes. Anyone you can think of? Anyone really inspirational to you that way? Yeah, definitely. There's there's so many people who mm. helped me along on the journey and opened the doors for me at the right time. Um, and I'd probably be here all day listing them to you. But okay. I guess the best way to answer that is the first person that came to mind, a gentleman called Mark Bentley. Um, okay. And you'll hate it because he's like incredibly humble and stuff, you know, okay. like so annoying. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would I would shout out Mark Bentley. Mark Bentley. Um, yeah, he opened a few doors for me and um, he just, he was the first person, I think, that allowed an environment where you were able to fail confidently and then move on. And it was never a case of, you know, that's a mistake. So mm -hmm. I think um, he's the first person that demonstrated that to me. You read about it in the books and you read about it online about failing fast. Mm -hmm. He was the first manager that showed me how to do that in an actual work environment so i'll always remember oh, him fondly he's live by the way i'm not talking about him yeah, yeah. Gone, but, um our, our time together i'll remember fondly i learned a lot okay and do you think you're going to be someone's mark bentley um <laughs> in 10 years time i'll have them on the podcast i ask them and they go who inspired you um i don't know that i've You've inspired got a similar style anybody or? um i try um if i can um to create a similar environment and, okay. I, and I think that is because I benefit from it. I benefit from being able to experiment. Um, and so I always try my best to do that. Um, so the best thing to do would be ask people who have left me and moved on, and not yeah. the ones that work with me now. But um, yeah, who knows one day. I'll be, I'll be keeping a listen on the podcast to see if Man. anybody appears. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>